Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining today's Tonoma Coast Incentive Project Requirements webinar. My name is Vivian Mather, and I am Project Coordinator for the California Electric Vehicle Infrastructure Project, Cali PIP, here at the Center for Sustainable Energy. The agenda for today's webinar will begin with a review of Cali PIP's background. We'll then shift into a message about COVID-19 and the new 2020 project schedule. We'll pause here for a brief question and answer session. Next, we'll discuss the Sonoma Coast Incentive Project final requirements and details. Finally, we will conclude with the longer Q&A session. We have a few panelists today to help with presentation and Q&A. We have Andy Hoskinson from the Center for Sustainable Energy, Brian Fobble from the California Energy Commission, and Nelson Lomelli from Sonoma Clean Powder. I'd like to note for this webinar that we may experience technical difficulties. We appreciate your patience in case we encounter any issues. This presentation will also be emailed to all attendees after the webinar today. The presentation is also being recorded and will be available via email and through the CEC docket shortly. Now I'd like to transition the presentation over to Andy Hoskinson from the Center for Sustainable Energy. Thank you, Divya. Um, morning, uh, good afternoon, depending on where you're at. Um, my name is Andy Hoskinson. I'm with the Center for Sustainable Energy. Uh, we wanted to uh, go briefly into the, uh, the Cali VIP background. For those of you not familiar with uh, the California Electric Vehicle Infrastructure Project, or Cali VIP, it was designed by the California Energy Commission to implement targeted incentive projects across California to address specific regions EV charging needs. Uh, as well, it was designed to provide a mechanism to speed up the installation of funding processes for the installation of electric vehicle charging. This is Brian Fauble with the California Energy Commission. So I just wanted to do the next two slides real quick about additional background on Cali VIP. Um, if you are a frequent attendee to our um, webinars and workshops, you'll hear this message again, but if you're new, definitely wanted to give you some information. The difference really between Cali VIP and incentive projects is another term that we'll use uh, frequently. So Cali VIP is really meant to be the interface that all stakeholders really will access and utilize when applying for rebates. Cali VIP is essentially the website, calivip.org. It is a platform that houses all of the individual incentive projects itself um, and will have additional resources such as Cali VIP Connects, which allows uh, stakeholders to search in one place for all EV charging related installation services, whether it's um, a supplier, a manufacturer, a network provider, and a, a contractor, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we also have resources about understanding um, eligible equipment, understanding the permitting jurisdictions, and utilizing GoBiz's map for um, AB 1236. So there's lots of resources on the website that is aimed to help educate um, the state and stakeholders on anything EV charging related. Now, an incentive project is pretty much like what a solicitation um, includes at the Energy Commission. Each project that is released under Cali BIP, these incentive projects, will have their own separate landing page that will have all the information you need to know about that individual project. One project may be similar to the next, maybe 100% different from the next. And so it's really important that if you wanna know everything about one project, you go to that landing page and you read that implementation manual. That landing page itself also will have, once a project is live, a funding visualization to keep track and let you know how much funds are really still available when you're looking to apply. To date, um, there's six projects active with um, total funding of $73.5 million. So this 
uh, goes into those six projects. Again, um, nothing new if you've seen this before, but showing the evolution of Cali VIP, where the first project to launch was in December 27, 2017. 27 would be uh, weird. Fresno County, the first project was for level two chargers only. This project has now since closed um, and still has active projects, but funding for new applications are not available. Those funds were rolled into the San Joaquin Valley project for Fresno County. Our second project was a Southern California project um, for four counties, Los Angeles, Orange, Riverside, and San Bernardino. This was our largest and still is our largest project to date with $29 million. And this project was for DC fast chargers only. After that, we decided that we've created two mechanisms now and wanted to utilize both technologies in all of our projects moving forward. So our four projects in 2019 allow applicants to apply for just level two funds, just DC fast charger, or a combination of both. Um, and since then again, we have six projects, and today we will be talking about our seventh. Okay, thanks, Brian. Um, now we've got a little bit of the background on Cali VIP out of the way, we did want to take a moment um, to just recognize the uh, unique um, situation that we find ourselves battling um, with COVID-19 pandemic. And we do want to note that our top priority during the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic is the health and safety of everyone that's involved, our applicants, stakeholders, um, et cetera. Um, specifically, CSE has closed um, our offices and stated remote work for all employees. Um, however, we do not expect remote work to interrupt Cali VIP operations at this time. Um, that said, the California Energy Commission, the Center for Sustainable Energy, and other organizations that are supporting CaliVIP are regularly monitoring COVID-19 from multiple information sources with an aim to develop appropriate responses. Uh, so one of those things to note is as the COVID-19 situation continues to develop, appropriate responses may include um, flexibility for certain aspects of CaliVIP. As an example, application extensions are currently being granted on a case-by-case -case basis, but at this time, no other project changes have been implemented. We are planning for all three of the 2020 projects that are scheduled for summer, fall, and actually winter to launch uh, as scheduled. And we'll go through that reordered launch um, order uh, just momentarily. Um, I do want to note as well that the Energy Commission, the link provided in, in this uh, presentation, made very clear that fuel providers, including electric vehicle chargers, are determined to be essential services. And to stay up to date with all of this, um, any changes that could be uh, made or uh, flexibility that's shown uh, within CaliVIP will be communicated via email. So I strongly encourage everyone to go to CaliVIP.org and sign up uh, to receive the latest information. And with that, I think we have a uh, poll question. We wanted to just get some information from um, all the attendees this morning. If you please take a moment to go ahead and uh, respond to the poll question, which should be up on your screen at this time. Okay, I uh, wanted to uh, thank you all uh, for participating in that poll. Again, this information can be useful to us in uh, making sure that we are uh, being responsive um, from a Cali VIP implementation standpoint. So um, our last um, public workshop for the 2020 projects was in early fall of 2019, um, and significant um, uh, amount has transpired since then, most notably the COVID-19 pandemic that we, we uh, currently find ourselves in. We wanted to share with you the updated um, the updated 2020 project schedule, um, as this webinar uh, is focusing on the final uh, incentive project final requirements. Uh, we will be releasing that in summer of 2020. Um, again, please sign up at CaliVIP.org for stay informed. Uh, we will hold um, additional webinars uh, right in advance of that launch uh, and narrow that window for, uh, for the project launch as we get closer to it. Following the Sonoma the Coast Incentive Project, we'll be launching the Peninsula Silicon Valley Incentive Project. Uh, that will focus on 
level two and DC fast charging in the San Mateo and Santa Clara County. And then uh, that is anticipated release of fall 2020. And then finally, the San Diego County Incentive Project, again for DC and level two uh, charging with an anticipated release of winter 2020. And so to uh, Divya for a short uh, Q&A session. Hi everyone, as Andy mentioned, we'll now pause for a brief Q&A session. Please submit your questions via the question box on GoToWebinar dashboard. There will be a longer Q&A session at the end of this presentation. So if we are unable to answer your question during this time, we will answer it during the next Q&A session. One of the questions we did receive is, when white might we hear the details on the Sonoma Coast Incentive Project? Andy, are you able to answer that? Uh, yes, the details on the Sonoma Coast Incentive Project. We're going to go through the final requirements uh, in uh, this uh, webinar and um, in later spring, um, you will have an opportunity for an additional webinar um, and just in advance of the launch of the Sonoma Coast Center project. Yeah, I want, this is Brian. I wanted to just add a little on that. So again, this is the main purpose of today's webinar is to talk about the final requirements for Sonoma Coast Incentive Project. This is not to say here's what's proposed. This is to say, again, here's the final requirements and uh, the next steps. So if we've if you've participated in multiple projects or any projects in the past, what we typically try to do is announce a webinar with our final requirements. Um, we then have a landing page go up just for that project, typically two months-ish before the project launches. And then we'll hold another marketing webinar about a week or two in advance of the launch date. And that's the um, webinar we'll we will eventually say here's the day that we will launch and answer any last minute questions again go over the process of applying etc but today you will be getting all the final requirements um, detailed for the sonoma coast project thanks brian this next question um, can also come to you as well does CEC have recommended resources on how to monetize LCFS credits? So LCFS has been um, a hot topic for different projects. Um, obviously right now, the Sacramento County Incentive Project is the only um, project that requires the LCFS dispensed fuel credit for level twos going to our project partner who will then in generate, sell, and deposit those revenues back into Cali VIP for additional um, rebates. All of our other projects do not have a requirement, but that's not to say that we don't want the LCFS to be utilized in some way. And so um, there are multiple resources or options for LCFS um, that right now we are working on uh, messaging that might be included in uh, the implementation manuals or resources online, but just verbally what I could say is there's uh, multiple options where some manufacturers of the equipment might offer a discount if you assign the credits to them. Um, some EVSPs will sometimes discount your networking agreement or um, provide that for free depending on the scale again as well. And um, everything else, you know, if you're really not going to use it, there's always cities or other generators in your local areas that will be willing to accept those for on your behalf and manage and sell them. Thank you, Brian. We have another question around funding. Is there any danger that funding will be constrained due to budget cuts associated with coronavirus? So I'd say um, our projects that have been previously identified are all of our 2020 projects. The funding is set and um, those are not um, going to be adjusted. Um, our 2021 projects are what we're in work right now. And obviously we know the governor has decided to redo his budget. And so until that budget is done, um, those are the unsure funds at this time for 2021. So stay tuned, please. 
Thank you, Brian. We will take one last question for this brief Q&A session, but um, I would like to just let, remind everyone that if we haven't answered your question yet, we will do our best to answer it during the second Q&A session at the end of the presentation, which will be much longer than this one. Last question for this Q&A session, are these programs still planned to be first come first serve or will they be evaluated based on merit? Prior projects had a mad dash to complete applications with all funds being reserved in less than two hours. So Cali VIP will always be a first come first serve service. We are working on mechanisms to shore up um, applications that are received are truly applications that are ready to progress um, at the time of application and have a high probability of completion. And we'll talk further about that in this uh, webinar, as well as planning a webinar for later this summer to solely talk about that issue. Thank you, Brian. Okay, thank you everyone for participating in this brief Q&A. If you do have any questions throughout the presentation, please submit them through the Q&A box, and we will answer them during the longer Q&A session at the end. Thank you. Back to you, Andy. Okay. Thank you, Divya. Um, so I'm now turning our attention to the upcoming uh, incentive project, the Sonoma Coast Incentive Project, with its planned launch in summer of 2020. Uh, we'll get into some details on that now. First, I want to note um, that the Sonoma Coast Incentive Project is a partnership of the California Energy Commission, the Northern Sonoma County Air Pollution Control District, and Sonoma Clean Power. That partnership has enabled the funding that, um, that you see here on the slide. So looking at the launch in summer of 2020 in Sonoma County, uh, that's fiscal year 2020-21, you would have $3.3 million of available DC fast charge funding in Sonoma County. Uh, within Mendocino County, there reached $300,000 available for DC fast charging at time of launch. Also at time of launch in Sonoma, there'd be $1.6 million worth of level two funding. And in Mendocino, $450,000 available for level two funding. The Sonoma County will receive in years two and three, after launch, additional $550,000 um, from the uh, funding partners Sonoma Clean Power and Northern Sonoma Air Pollution Control District. So there are some important uh, project definitions with regard to uh, rebates, uh, rebate amounts. And the first is disadvantaged community or DAC. Um, a disadvantaged community is defined as anything in the top 25% of Cal and Viro Scheme 3.0 or if uh, released in the future 4.0 uh, score. In addition to the disadvantaged community uh, designation, uh, Cal VIP for the 2020 project, including Sonoma Coast, uh, in current projects, will be using low income community definition, uh, slowing from 80 1550. That, uh, that is defined as census tracts that are at or below 80% of state wide median income. Uh, and then finally, for the Sonoma Coast Incentive Project, unincorporated community, which is previously referred to as rural community, our important mission, those include unincorporated towns in Sonoma and Mendocino counties. So keeping those definitions uh, in mind for the next couple of uh, slides, we'll go through first the DC fast charger rebate amounts for the Sonoma Coast and Center project uh, and for the other 20, uh, 20 projects. There are DC fast charger rebates um, that first are defined by the power uh, output level of the DC fast charger. And that's this a minimum of 50 kilowatts up to 99.9 .9 kilowatts. Um, there is a market rebate of up to $50,000 or 75% of the total project cost, whichever is less. And for uh, 50 kilowatts and 99.9 .9 kilowatts uh, DC fast charger, it is located within a disadvantaged community, as previously defined, a low income community, as previously defined, or both, 
the rebate would be up to $60,000 or 75% of the total project cost, whichever is less. As a reminder here, all um, project costs are based on actual costs um, that are submitted uh, in invoices as um, part of the application process. So the DC fast charger, uh, for fast chargers that are 100 capable of 100 kilowatt or greater charging uh, rate, um, there is a rebate of up to $70,000 or 75% of total project cost, what we call general market rebate. Or again, if located in a disadvantaged community or low income community or both, we believe it would be up to $80,000 or 75% of total project costs. Uh, looking at the level two rebate amounts, uh, we have the base rebate um, per connector as $5,000. There are three adders that are available to uh, applications on the Sonoma Coast and Center project. The first is the multi-unit dwelling for locations such as uh, apartment communities, and that's an additional $1,000 per connector. For level two sites located within a disadvantaged community, a low-income community, or both, there's an additional $500 per connector. I do want to note this is the difference from the uh, 2020 workshops back in fall of 2019, where there was a, a proposed a possible $500 for distance advantage community and a possible $500 for low income. That's actually been combined. There's one adder, whether you're in disadvantaged community, low income community, or both. Uh, and then finally, as uh, noted before, um, there's an unincorporated community definition, which is previously referred to as a rural uh, community. And that pattern is $1,000 per level two connector. So the maximum level two rebate could be up to $7,500. Okay, looking at the maximum number of um, uh, chargers. Uh, per application. Uh, in the Sonoma Coast and Surf Project, uh, the maximum number of DC fast chargers that one could apply for on a single application is four, and so level two, um, 10 um, uh, level two connectors. I do you want to note as with prior projects, additional chargers can be installed. They just won't add any uh, eligible uh, uh, additional rebates from Cali VIP. So if you had six DC fast chargers or 15 level two that you were going to install the site. Um, that's perfectly acceptable. You apply, you indicate that full amount, and the rebate would just be calculated off of the maximum of either four DC fast chargers or 10 level two. We do also want to note that because of what we call an active application uh, cap or a 10 cap uh, in Mendocino County, DC fast charger applications um, would not be able to uh, be approved for more than three DC fast chargers because it would violate that active application cap. We'll go through uh, an example and explanation of that a little later in this uh, webinar. Okay, um, we just mentioned the uh, active application cap. Um, that is determined on a countywide basis. So there's a cap for Mendocino County and a separate cap for Sonoma County. Uh, that's a cap on the uh, total dollars, uh, total dollar amount of active applications for any one uh, applicant. So it's back to their organization and their paired uh, tax or employee employer identification number. Uh, do you want to note, we'll go through a good example of it, but once an application is completed and paid, um, that comes, that amount would come off of uh, their calculations to count against their cap. It is just active applications that are in um, and applied up through and before a paid step. So again, I mentioned the county um, cap is a little different for Sonoma and Mendocino. In Sonoma County, with a little, of about six million dollars total um, uh, project funding, that active um, application cap limit is four hundred thousand dollars. Whereas in Mendocino County, with uh, just one hundred fifty thousand dollars total uh, available, the active application cap is one hundred and sixty thousand dollars. 
Okay, going through an example of that, we'll take a look at Sonoma County, which as we discussed in the slide before, is, has a $400,000 capital extractive application. We'll use Fable Company as an example. If uh, the company were to file three applications in Sonoma County and get their funds reserved for those three, um, they would have an application for $200,000, a second for $100,000, and say a third for, for $100,000. They'd have a total of $400,000 of active applications. That would mean is they would need to completely finish and receive the rebate for at least one of the projects to be able to file additional uh, applications in Sonoma County. So in the case that they complete the $200,000 application, um, their current uh, calculation against their active, active application cap would drop from $400,000 uh, down to $200,000. They would be able to apply for uh, an additional application or multiple applications up to that $200,000 in freedom under the cap. When we look at who are eligible applicants under the Sonoma Coast Incentive Project, um, that is private companies, uh, whether business owners, electric vehicle charging station manufacturers, not for profits, electric vehicle service providers electrical contractors, faith-based or community-based organizations, et cetera. There's not a requirement um, that the applicant is a site owner or site host if they have authorization from the site owner or site host, uh, and we will cover that you know, a little later in the webinar as well. Additional applicants could include public agencies, tribal communities. There's a requirement that um, uh, each of the organizations have a valid California business license. Next slide, please. So as I noted with um, the partners Sonoma Clean Power and Northern Sonoma County Air Pollution Control District uh, providing uh, more funding to the project, there are some additional requirements if an applicant is to receive uh, funding from uh, one of those partners for Sonoma Clean Power to be eligible, site host and the installed charters must be an active Sonoma Clean Power customer. And this is important. At the time of application, you're going to need to provide the PG&E account number and the account holder name um, to receive Northern Sonoma County Air Pollution Control District uh, funding need to be uh, located within the district's uh, jurisdiction for the installation site and need to be within the Air Pollution Control District's jurisdiction. So what sites are eligible for uh, rebates under the Sonoma Coast Insurance Project. Looking at DC fast chargers, um, those sites are explicitly listed here on this slide. Um, there are not uh, locations or site types outside of these uh, that would be eligible. Uh, these sites are defined in the implementation manual uh, that we put, that will uh, shortly we'll talk about the uh, posting of, uh, of that resource to the uh, and the incentive project landing page. Uh, one addition here is the colleges and universities um, that has uh, been uh, added. Same with the requirements for DC SAS charges. The installation site needs to be uh, within the project's defined region, so that's Sonoma and Mendocino County. The DC SAS charges are required to be available to the public 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. Um, in general, the site needs to be uh, well lit, uh, secure, and generally in compliance with all federal, state, municipal laws, uh, rules, codes, uh, standards. So, looking at the eligibility um, for a level two site, uh, it's very uh, much more expansive than for DC fast charging sites. Again, the site needs to be located inside the project uh, defined region, so Sonoma and Mendocino County. The level two chargers need to be provided on a shared use basis, where you do not have a single charger dedicated to, say, a single resident of an apartment community or a single employee at a workplace, for instance. Um, but in general, many site types are eligible, whether that's schools, public agencies, workplaces, tribal lands, uh, light duty fleets. It's possible that uh, medium duty fleets. Uh, a medium duty vehicle and a mixed light duty medium duty fleet could also use um, the electric vehicle uh, chargers under their IT. 
Um, in general, for level two sites, um, it's easier to take the only sites that are not eligible would be single family um, or um, uh, two family uh, residents. So what are the eligible uh, costs under Cal EIT, whether for a level two or a DC fast charger installation? Those of course include all the equipment, the EDFV or electric vehicle supply equipment, charger itself, of course, transformers, panels, advanced energy storage, you know, any of the planning and design um, for the project, uh, all of the installation costs, labor and materials, uh, utility service orders, utility, uh, utility costs uh, for the electric vehicle charging, demand management equipment, networking agreements for the chargers, and extended warranties for the chargers would be eligible costs as well as signage, stenciling, uh, and stub outs for uh, provision of future electric vehicle charging. There are a few uh, costs that would be uh, ineligible. Permit fees, which are required, um, uh, which are required government uh, costs are, are themselves not eligible as well. Solar panels, which are funded through other uh, California Energy Commission uh, programs are not eligible under the uh, Cal EIP rebate. And of course, costs that are already paid by uh, another rebate or incentive program uh, would not count as eligible costs under Cal EIP. So we're going to go into the uh, full application process in a um, little more detail the performance period for the DC fast charger or a combination DC fast charger level two applications and then standalone level two uh, applications. But uh, the general performance period that an applicant has to move from receiving notice that funds have been reserved for the application to completing the installation, turning on the equipment, submitting all of the required documentation is 15 months for DC fast charger chargers or combo uh, applications and is nine months for level two electric vehicle chargers. So there are some important um, time frames that this is talking uh, questions that weren't uh, yet answered in the brief uh, question session. And again, a reminder, we have a much lengthier uh, Q&A session coming up at the end of this. Um, but some of these details, I think, in here may answer a couple of the questions that came up. Um, again, each application must be completed before the end of the performance deadline, that clock can does start when funds are reserved. Um, there's a notice and status in the application uh, dashboard um, to the applicant uh, changes at that time. Uh, applicants should not apply until you really have an executed site host agreement and a completed site verification form. We'll go through the timing to submit that site verification form. We want to we'll strongly encourage um, all applicants to be ready to move forward with their projects uh, at the time that they are applying for them. Uh, planning costs, planning and design costs, engineering and design, for instance, um, permit, uh, for, pursuing the permits, pursuing utility, uh, utility design, those costs can be incurred prior to funding the reserve at the applicant's risk, um, as long as it is after March 31st, 2020. Again, to see successful projects, we strongly encourage you to communicate with the necessary utility provider from the beginning if you're going to require, um, or the reason they require upgraded service or new service in the Sonoma Coast Incentive Project, that's largely uh, PG&E, uh, as well as um, uh, City of Hillsburg and the Kaya um, public owned utilities. Again, at the completion of the performance period, the station does need to be fully operational and open for use um, by the public. So as an example, on new construction sites, if the chargers uh, were completed and turned on, um, but the permitting authority has not issued, yet issued a certificate of occupancy for that site and the public cannot access it, um, that, would, that location or application would not yet be completed. Um, all application documents um, do need to be submitted and approved um, by First Energy um, by the application deadline. 
I would strongly encourage you to reach out to Senate Supreme Law Review staff if you see any delays arising in this project, whether those are um, of a nature that is related to COVID-19, like uh, uh, COVID-19 pandemic, or whether they are um, working with um, a utility or a permitting authority, um, equipment uh, supply problem, any, anything that can cause a delay, please reach out to us. Okay, so there's some very important um, items to uh, uh, to note for the Sonoma Coast Center Project, particularly those who may be familiar with prior Cal EIP and Center Project. You're likely familiar with the site verification form. Uh, that is a form that um, provides authorization and it's clear. We provide authorization from the property owner site host um, for the installation on that site. Uh, it is a new requirement under Sonoma Coast Concern Project and future Cali DMC uh, 2020 projects that the site verification form is required for all applications, even if the property owner is um, applying directly. As we noted before, very important that you have that site verification form completed um, for and ready. We encourage at the time you actually apply, it does need to be uploaded within five calendar days of application submittal, um, and if it's not uh, provided, your application will be uh, canceled. Uh, as a, a use reminder, when uploading documents to Cali DIT, you will need to take two actions. First is uploading the document, and then to successfully submit the CFP, you need to actually click the submit button to send it on to Center for Family Energy. The site verification form, um, along with the Internet Project landing page and some of the other resources we'll go through, including the implementation manual that Brian uh, referred to earlier, will be available on the Cali ERP website on April 22nd. Again, if you have uh, any questions regarding this or you need assistance completing the form, please reach out to the Center for Sustainable Energy. As an example of that slide, this is what will be posted there uh, is, is the site verification form. Very important that the installation address that you're putting on this form matches exactly what you put in the on what you filed on the online application. Inconsistencies between the two may result in the application uh, being rejected and or uh, canceled. Uh, again, the applicant organization information needs to match that. Um, which is uh, providing the online application. We have help text here in the site verification form to make it very clear who the applicant organization is, um, uh, is and then this needs to be executed by the appropriate um, authority at that applicant organization. The second half of the site verification form includes the property owner information. Again, ensure that um, this is all provided correctly. Use the help, reference the help test that is on the form to ensure you complete it properly. Okay, in general, you need uh, able to begin your installation, and, um, and that generally is after your fund reserve date. You receive an uh, email. Uh, transactional email notifying you if your application has been um, approved to move into fund reserve. Um, the only exception to that is planning uh, costs such as design engineering, drawing, utility service, or et cetera, um, that previously mentioned, can be incurred at applicants' uh, own risk um, as long as those uh, that work uh, began, had begun after March 31st, 2020. I do want to note here that if your application is determined ineligible uh, and you previously uh, incurred some signing uh, costs, those costs will not be reimbursed under uh, uh, Cal EIP. Okay, um, I want to go through in a little more detail the DC fast charger or combination where you have DC and level two at one site uh, application process. So the first thing I'm going to note is it is possible to apply for both uh, DC and level two chargers at sites as long as the site qualifies for the DC fast charging. 
um, as we went through uh, in, uh, elegant installation sites before. I do want to note that this is the, um, the this is the way that you need to apply if you intend to do both technologies on um, on a single site. Uh, if in processing that uh, search a combination application, we determine that funds are available for one technology but not the other, um, we can convert um, that. We'll be able to convert that combination application um, to the correct uh, single technology. So again, if you're doing both level two and DC, uh, you need to provide a uh, combination application, not separate level two, separate DC for each site. So the first site, uh, first steps for DC fast charger uh, combination application. Uh, after you have the site host agreement and the site verification form signed, uh, is to go ahead and log on, uh, select your equipment and apply online. You'll need to upload that site verification form uh, within five calendar days to have your application um, uh, stay valid and avoid being canceled. With uh, the site verification form uh, submitted, Center for Sustainable Energy in step two will review the application and initial verification to confirm all eligibility. If all eligibility is uh, will be confirmed, in step three, your funds will be reserved and your 15 month performance trade clock will begin. Very important addition for the 2020 projects, starting with the Sonoma Coast and Center project, is step four, which is what we would call a progress checkpoint. It occurs um, within and not later than 60 calendar days from your fund reserve date. There's a requirement to provide evidence of either a commit submittal or evidence of utility design um, application submittal, again, within 60 days of your fund reserve date. Um, which of these is required depends on the uh, installation that you're doing. If you are installing either level two, or, uh, in this case, DC com combination DC level two, um, and the installation is going on existing service without requirements um, for the utility to upgrade that service, then you need to submit evidence of your uh, permit submittal. Uh, if the design required either an upgrade to existing service or uh, from from the utility or a uh, new service from the utility, then you need to submit the utility evidence of uh, utility design submittal. Uh, again, on April 22nd, the uh, the consent project landing page will be going live. In addition to the implementation manual and the site verification form provided there, a sample supporting document, which also includes information on this evidence of permit by utility design submittal, will be available for download and review. I encourage you to uh, review uh, the implementation manual requirements for this step, as well as example supporting documents. And if you have any questions, to reach out to the Center for Sustainable Energy. This step was uh, added based on uh, public comment uh, in, the, in the past, and a desire to ensure that CalGIP is funding projects that are ready to move forward and successfully took progression. Okay, staying with the DC fast charger combination. Um, after you, you were to complete the, um, the evidence of permit or utility uh, submittal, um, you would uh, have the remainder of your, up to the remainder of your performance period to upload um, all of your final documents uh, for uh, inner ceremony review. You have an, uh, in that step five, that's just ongoing in that. Um, that 15 month performance period. You do have an option up to uh, eight months from the funds reserve date to submit a minimum of three documents. You're signed, uh, complete your progress checkpoint of the evidence to submit a utility submittal, submit your uh, applicate, signed application, uh, design uh, engineering invoice and the permits for the project, and you can receive a milestone payment that's up to 60% of um, the rebates that you're eligible for. That is an optional milestone step, though. Um, 
whether you take that or whether you just go to submit final documents, uh, once those final documents are submitted, the Center for Sustainable Energy reviews those to ensure that they are uh, they are complete, accurate, um, and would then uh, determine uh, the project as eligible for payment. Um, the there was a questions earlier. We generally get questions regarding the time frame for review of those final documents. Um, the quality of the documents coming in, the volume uh, that we see at different times can, can affect um, our, our review and processing on those. To make those processing times as short as possible, we highly encourage you to follow um, all the guidance and the sample supporting documents and the clean documentation uh, in, in, uh, in compliance with uh, project requirements. Uh, after review and approval of those documents, um, so if someone wanted you will uh, mail a uh, rebate checkout within 15 days. Okay, looking at the level two rebate process, um, it's fairly similar with a couple of notable exceptions to the DC fast charger combination. Uh, it begins the same way with an online application. Again, you should have your site verification form ready uh, at the time you're applying. Uh, as it is required to be submitted within five calendar days of filing the application online. Without that, the level two application would also be canceled. Step two, Center for Sustainable Energy reviews initial verification to ensure things like uh, installation and uh, installation site and applicant eligibility. With that, um, you're, you move to step three, where your funds are reserved for your level two project and you have a nine month uh, performance period. Uh, to complete your project. As with the DC fast charging and combination application new to the Sonoma Coast and Center project and future 2020 uh, uh, projects is step four, which is the need to provide evidence of submit submittal or utility design. Uh, the details are the same as I explained on the DC fast charging. Um, and again, we can take uh, questions uh, at the end of this uh, webinar should there be any additional. Um, step five, uh, following that progress, uh, completion of that progress checkpoint within 60 calendar days is uh, your window up to nine months uh, to submit your final documents for CSC review and issuance of your rebate payment. We're going to cover the basic minimum requirements for uh, DC fast charger equipment. Um, first, DC fast chargers are required to have uh, both CHAdeMO and uh, SAE CCS combo connectors. They must be capable of uh, charging uh, uh, at greater than 50 kilowatts. We do want to note the rebates that we uh, discussed earlier. There's a, a DC fast charger um, uh, rebate uh, for higher capacity DC fast chargers over uh, one, 100 kilowatt or greater. Um, that 100 kilowatts to receive that rebate is determined um, as the minimum uh, power uh, provision that the, your selected DC fast charger con configuration could support. So as an example, what would not qualify for the 100 kilowatt is um, a, a, a DC fast charger that's 125 um, kilowatts but has two pairs of uh, Chatamo and SAE CCS uh, connectors capable of simultaneously charging two electric vehicles at 62.5 kilowatts. That would be eligible for the 50 to 99.9 kilowatt uh, rebate as opposed to the 100 and, uh, 100 and greater uh, kilowatt DC fast charger rebate. All DC fast chargers do need to be networked with Wi Fi, solar, and LAN. Um, and that networking needs to be capable of providing remote diagnostics, remote start, uh, capable of utilization of usage data collection, and all DC fast chargers do require a five-year networking agreement. Again, that networking agreement is eligible toward uh, total project cost. Continuing with the DC fast charger requirements, uh, equipment uh, requirements, you need to be capable of accepting multiple forms of payment, uh, in, uh, including credit card that can be through near field communication, uh, mobile app, uh, toll free phone number, et cetera. 
Um, underlined here, we want to note that publicly available DC fast chargers, which is the only kind that are eligible for a rebate under Cali VIP, um, uh, they do not have to charge, but they do need to be publicly available. Um, if they're installed and open for public use on or after January 1st, 2022, they'll be required by law to have a credit card uh, EMD is either on either the charger or on a kiosk that is serving the charger. Uh, every DC fast charger needs to be certified under a nationally recognized testing laboratory program, and the DC fast charger needs to be capable to revert to an open communication protocol standard. Next slide, please. Andy, Andy I wanted to add one thing right there. Um, just to clarify for everyone, Cali VIP does not require a credit card reader on any charger at this time. Um, we are just putting this out there for public knowledge that this is a law from ARB's SB 454 as currently written, but this is not a Cali VIP requirement that the charger must have a credit card EMV reader or a swipe at this time, just to clarify. Thank you, Brian. Okay, turning our attention to level two equipment requirements. Um, it's required that every level two electric vehicle charger have a uh, day 1772 connector, that it is capable of at least uh, 6.2 kilowatt charging or greater. Level two electric vehicle chargers in the Cali IP need to be energy star certified. They must be networked, um, same capabilities as DC fast chargers with remote diagnostics, remote start, usage or utilization data collection, and the networking agreement for level two electric vehicle chargers needs to be a minimum of two years. Again, that networking agreement cost is an eligible rebate cost. Okay, as with the DC fast chargers, um, if payments required, it does need to accept some form of credit uh, cards um, and multiple forms of payment. An example that we're providing our DC fast charging would be applicable here. As Brian had noted, um, not a Cali VIP requirement, but just notice of um, uh, card regulations implementing SB 454. Publicly available level two chargers that charge a fee and are installed or open to public use on or after January 1st, 2023, will be required by law to have a credit card EMV reader on the charger or on a kiosk that's serving those chargers. Again, not a Cali VIP requirement um, at this time, but um, we wanted to ensure that everyone is aware of the, um, the regulations that will come into place in future years. Uh, level two equipment, uh, as well as the DC, needs to be uh, nationally uh, certified or nationally recognized testing laboratory and does need to be able to revert to open communication standards. And also, okay. sorry, um, one last one last topic or point around the credit card reader. Um, for both those technologies, that those dates are for chargers installed on or after that date. If you have a charger installed um, before, you have 10 years to comply with um, the law. So um, if you install it here, we're seeing January 1, 2023 for level two. If you install that in December, 2022, you don't have to update that charger with a credit card reader um, for 10 years. So you have plenty of time. Thanks again for that addition, Brian. I wanted to go through just a few additional key project features um, I referenced before. Um, we call an applicant uh, dashboard. Um, once uh, you create an account under Cal UIP, you'll have access to a dashboard um, that will allow you to, number one, apply for any uh, rebates under uh, Cal UIP Incentive Project Select the Phenomenal Focus Incentive Project. Also allows you to view all of your applications and then to go specifically into each application and upload any requirements, required documents online. As a reminder here, um, there's a two-step process to uploading your documents. Um, you need to ensure you take both. Um, the first is to actually upload the document. 
And then once you're satisfied with what what you've uploaded to click submit and formally submit that into the uh, Cali VIP system. Um, the that system does also provide a number of transactional and reminder emails. So we encourage you to uh, ensure uh, per our FAQ that you receive, uh, you're set up to receive those emails successfully out of, um, keeping out of your spam. Um, they do notify you of critical application status changes such as moving into a farm reserve uh, status or approaching a critical um, progress checkpoint milestone like the evidence of committed utility submittal. Uh, we do maintain a hotline, um, both phone and uh, email. Those will be available on the Internet Project landing page of the Sonoma Post Concern Project on April 22nd. So I can see this. Um, so right now we have a slide number 43 about equipment manufacturers, how to be involved with Cali VIP. Um, so we have a mechanism where the equipment manufacturer, if you haven't already, you'll go and create a new account on Cali VIP. And it's really important that when you go to create that account that you select um, what type it is as a specific equipment manufacturer type. This will get you um, additional fields in your dashboard when you log in. And what it'll allow is once you're validated by CSE as an actual equipment manufacturer, you can go on your dashboard and self upload um, the specifications of your charger. And that gets submitted to Cali VIP or to CSE in Cali VIP to review the eligibility of those chargers. And CSE will work with you to. Uh, make sure all the requirements are met, and then get some final um, information about, you know, pictures, contact information, and a little blurb of a um, about the charger section, and that will then be uploaded to our eligible equipment PDF, as well as to the drop-down menu on the application process for people to select your equipment. Yes, I can do it. Thank you, Brian. Apologies for the technical difficulties there. Um, some additional uh, takeaways from the Sonoma Coast and Center Project. Electric vehicle service providers, contractors, uh, and others are all eligible to apply with site owner permission. Um, applications are limited on a rebate. Um, uh, active uh, application cap on a, a per county basis. Uh, and the limits are in the table uh, included in this presentation that we emailed out to all attendees uh, after uh, after this. Um, in addition, uh, DC fast charger and combination uh, rebates can optionally uh, be received in a milestone payment and then in a final payment, and that's optional there. And uh, level two rebate funds are received in only one payment, of, um, a uh, final payment uh, at or before your night conclusion and on month performance period. Okay, some key uh, a key day here again just referencing this the incentive project landing page for the Sonoma Coast Incentive Project will be up and available on April 22nd. Um, again you can go there to see um, all the project specifics including downloading the site verification form that you need to have completed uh, when you apply to be able to submit within five days. You can review the sample supporting documents to get prepared for launch, uh, including uh, getting details from the implementation manual and sample supporting documents on the new um, evidence of commit for utility submittal that occurs within two months of, uh, that, you, that you need to take care of within two months of the funds reserve date. Uh, as I mentioned uh, earlier, if there are some questions, we will have um, a Phenomenal Coast Center Project pre launch webinar. That webinar will provide a full walkthrough of the application process uh, and give you details on how to apply for uh, the UV incentives. That will uh, be in the late spring, I guess, in advance of a summer launch for the Sonoma Coast project. We'll shift into the last segment of our presentation now, the Q&A session. Um, just as a reminder, our panelists for today are Andy Hoskinson from the Center for Sustainable Energy, Brian Fobble from CEC, and Nelson Lomelli from Sonoma Clean Power. Feel free to submit your questions through the question box on GoToWebinar dashboard. And as they come in, I will read them and direct them to our panelists for today. 
one of the questions we received is, how is the 6.2 kilowatt capable requirement confirmed? Is this based off the nameplate or a spec sheet? The 6.2 kilowatt uh, capable is confirmed off of um, specification sheets from the equipment manufacturer. Great, thanks Andy. Nelson, I think this question could be directed towards you. Um, how do we handle the Sonoma Clean Power PG&E account number if the applicant is not a current SCP PG&E account holder, but will be requesting a new utility service as part of the project? That's a good question. I think um, to handle that kind of um, situation, if it's being installed at a location, um, like a property um, that where, where you're getting a new service drop, um, provide us with the property, the nearest property um, or the property owner's account number. If it's an entirely new location where there's no existing account number, um, you don't need to provide that as you can still qualify um, under the, the CEC's funding. Thank you, Nelson. Another question we received is, is integrated energy storage with the DCFC an eligible cost? If so, how would it cost be bundled into the allowable cost? Can you take that? Um, yes, integrated energy storage uh, supporting the uh, electric vehicle charging, whether it's DC or level two, is an eligible cost. Um, when you review uh, invoices uh, for the um, for the equipment and the installation, both will be considered um, considered under uh, cost for the project. And uh, it does not add any additional uh, rebate amounts. Obviously, that's triggered just by the number of DC or level two uh, chargers. And this is Brian. I would add that it's also important that to note that the energy storage must only serve the fast chargers and the charging station that cannot be integrated with uh, the building on site. Thank you, Andy and Brian. Another question we've received is the site verification form required at the time of submittal in order to reserve funds, or will you pl be placed in line? and held up to five days. So as long as the site verification form is uploaded within the, that five day time frame. Good question. So um, the site verification form is required to be submitted, so uploaded and submitted within five days of filing of the application. Um, for, as Brian had noted, Calgary IT project in Sonoma Coast is first come first serve. That is based on the filing uh, time of your application, and that place is uh, held and, uh, as long as that site verification form is submitted within five days. If it's not, um, the application will be canceled and you will need to reapply. Thanks, Sandy. How would one be able to certify that the DCFC equipment is capable of reverting to open protocol communication standards? So that would be um, from the manufacturers dealing with um, CSC directly um, and CEC if needed. But um, if it's an individual trying to worry about what chargers they're gonna be using, um, that's not something they have to worry about as our equipment must be on our eligible list to be um, eligible to select it. If you have something that you believe is eligible, you would have to work with CSC to get that done. Um, if a manufacturer has questions about it, um, definitely f complete the manufacturer uh, profile and start the process of uploading everything and contacting CSC um, to directly talk with CSE about eligible equipment, and we can help uh, verify all the requirements. Thanks, Brian. Another question we've received, if one owner has three different sites, what determines if you can apply as three different applications? I can uh, answer this. So applications, are um, filed um, for sites 
specifically. So the installation site address is critical um, to be uh, provided at the time of the application and to be correct for um, the site and uh, chargers and the rebate recipient that you want for for that site specifically. An owner with multiple sites, whether three or more, could apply for multiple sites. Um, the advancement of those applications to a funds reserve status would be subject to the active application cap in Mendocino or Sonoma County as noted before. Thank you, Andy. Another question we've received. Could you clarify whether the lack of an LCFS column in the DCFC and level two incentive level tables means that the previous proposal for seeding LCFS credits generating rights to local partners has been dropped? Yeah, this is Brian. I can confirm with you that. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead, Andy. Sorry. No, no, please. Yeah, this is Brian with the Energy Commission. So yes, um, LCFS has been dropped from requirements um, for fast chargers and level twos in this project. Um, and there is no required waiver to any individual. The applicant and the owner of the charger will be able to keep the LCFS to use as they see fit. Thanks, Brian. Another question we've received, are design permit expenses eligible before March 31st or from March 31st? From March 31st on. Again, until the application is in a funds reserve status though, those costs and that work would be at, at applicants on risk. Thank you, Andy. Another question we've received, how do you determine if your community is DAC or low-income community or unincorporated? Uh, I can answer, this is Andy with uh, CFP. So for determination of disadvantaged community status, um, we uh, reference uh, Calum Virus Screen uh, 3.0, uh, 3.0 uh, requirements and for low income community, it is uh, geographies or locations that meet the requirements of AB 1550, uh, with, uh, which the definitions are provided in uh, the implementation manuals, uh, as well as in the implementation manual, you'll have links to tools uh, and maps uh, to uh, pre verify those. Sites for, your, for yourself, so an applicant can uh, sort of self-serve on that. For purposes of um, rural, uh, sorry, uh, unincorporated, previously known as rural communities, um, those are all unincorporated towns and areas in Sonoma, Mendocino County. There are approximately 13 incorporated cities on um, the towns. Uh, in those two counties that are explicitly listed in the implementation manual as uh, not qualifying as the unincorporated. Thank you, Andy. Does the CEC have a requirement for the EBSC to be separately metered? This is Brian with the Energy Commission. No, there is no requirement that the equipment must be separately needed. Thank you. Another question we've received, how long before we are notified that the property we've applied for qualifies? And Andy with BSE. Um, our initial verification um, uh, step can uh, take as few as uh, several days and as much as um, uh, six or, or so weeks. Um, it depends on a number of factors, uh, including uh, volume of uh, not only applications to this project, but um, Cal DAP projects, 
uh, in general, um, either for initial verifications or for uh, for payments for extensions. Um, what I what I can note is going through initial verification. Um, ensuring that the information you provide in your online application is all um, complete as well as the site verification form uh, completed as required and that there's a complete match between the site verification form and the online application um, allows for a more expedient uh, review at initial verification up to uh, funds reserved. Additionally, um, Center for Thermal Energy and Initial Verification may reach out to applicants for clarification, um, provision of additional information to verify applicant eligibility or installation site eligibility, timely response and provision of uh, information to this uh, can also help to uh, expedite uh, review to fund reserve status. Yeah, and this is Brian with the Energy Commission, and I'd add that again, our level two chargers are pretty much eligible at any site type where um, the chargers are being shared use. They can be public, they can be private, and they can be light duty primary use fleet as well. So it just can't be a single family home and it cannot be a dedicated charger, say at a multi-unit dwelling for one residence parking garage or parking space. Now the fast chargers are the ones that are more likely needing to know if it's if your site is eligible or not, um, making sure it's not going to be locked behind a gate. It's going to the parking or the charger itself is going to be available 24/7, 365, and that it meets one of the definitions of an eligible site. And and if I'm correct, um, potential applicants could call CSE's helpline ahead of launch as well to get some of that clarification ahead of applying so that if they know um, in the call that they're not going to be eligible, that they're not going to need to apply. You're correct, Brian. We're happy to take calls on questions of site eligibility in advance. Thank you. Thanks, Brian and Andy. Another question we received, please clarify the revert to an open communication protocol standard requirement. At what time frame is the revert? So that's around the charger basically being able to utilize multiple systems. So it can't have um, for a network uh, response. And so the charger itself cannot have the ability to only work on one network um, at any time. This is a requirement that to say if company A goes out of business in the future, we don't want a charger that is just going to sit there and does not have the ability in some form to be utilized by another networking service by with some other company. And so um, all of that, again, is going to be initially done when a manufacturer is creating their profile and uploading their equipment. And so if there are specific questions, again, please go through the process of uploading your chargers and contacting CSE to work on that. But if you are a potential applicant, that is not something you're going to need to worry about as all of our chargers that are eligible will already meet all of our requirements. Thanks for clarifying, Brian. How is the recipient of a level two charger going to be held responsible for installing an EMV credit card system within 10 years? I'd say um, that would be something that would be, you know, need to understand the mechanisms, um, whether the charger itself has the capability, if um, there's going to be a kiosk available or et cetera. But it will be the owner of the charger's responsibility to comply with, as it is right now, all, all state, federal, local laws must always be complied by. So, um, once the rebate's paid for, we're paying for this charger, and um, 10 years from now, you know, that's the normal lifespan of chargers anyways. And so it would either be buying a new charger at that time or updating your charger as best as you can. Thanks, Brian. 
can you cover any data reporting required to any agency that might be associated with these projects? Yeah, so um, again, this is Brian with the Energy Commission. So there's a couple aspects. Um, we require our networking agreements of um, two years for level two and five years for DC fast charger. And what that basically does is grant um, the Center for Sustainable Energy um, pre-approved access to uh, the charger's data usage um, information straight from the network provider. Um, that information on that usage will be allowed to be shared with CSE, the Energy Commission, and any funding partner involved with that project. There's also other data um, that in the future will likely be publicly available through other mechanisms such as a statistics page similar to CVRP, um, mapping analysis showing where completed projects were installed, um, as well as um, a cost analysis interface in the future. So um, all of those are still TBD and in progress of being made and we'll have further information in the future. Thanks, Brian. Next question, can original equipment choices be changed after being accepted in our application? Oh, yes, yeah, this is uh, Andy with CSE. Um, original equipment selections can be uh, changed uh, after the original uh, application. Um, you would need to work with the assigned uh, rebate process and specialists reach out to um, the helpline for the Sonoma Coast and Center project. Again, we encourage you to do so as early as possible. So once you know that that, um, that equipment is changing um, and uh, don't think the question implied this, but it is sort of like for like. You're not changing level two for DC, for instance, um, but level two for level two, other level two equipment or DC for other DC equipment um, is uh, is possible. But again, because of the um, power difference, uh, uh, rebate difference based on power for DC, if you were to change equipment there, I strongly encourage you to reach out to CSD as early as possible if you're thinking of changing original equipment selection. Yeah, and this is Brian. I would also add that though that is allowed, um, changing equipment is not going to be a allowable um, extension request. Um, if you're changing your equipment, uh, make sure that you can still complete your project in time as well. Thank you. Next question, is there a tool you recommend to confirm the metric for low-income communities? For example, the Cal Enviro Screen 3.0 poverty map? Uh, yes, there is a tool. And again, we'll provide a link in this uh, presentation following uh, this, uh, the conclusion of this uh, webinar. Um, there's a priority populations map that maps the eight uh, California Air Resources Boards uh, Priority populations map that includes the AB 1550 low income communities um, uh, shown, and that's that's a searchable resource. We'll, we'll provide that link out to all applicants to verify that. And again, the Incentive Project landing page and the implementation manual uh, will include helpful links up to that resource as well. Thanks, Andy. Are there limitations on stacking funds? For example, can Cali VIP incentives be combined with ratepayer funds? Yeah, this is Brian with the Energy Commission. So yes, we allow stacking of funds um, up to the coordination where a um, applicant can potentially get their costs covered, but not exceeded. Obviously, we're not gonna try and use state funds to let people profit. Um, with that said, there are some programs that um, we do not stack with where, for example, um, if a program has a set defined amount or a quantity of chargers they are going to deploy, um, that is not one that Cali VIP will stack with. 
if most programs nowadays are a dollar amount um, saying that we'll have you know ten million dollars worth of rebates available we do stack with those and the justification there is any program that has a quantity of number of chargers they're going to deploy those quantities are likely going to be hit and reached anyways um, we want our rebates to stack with other programs to incentivize getting additional chargers above and beyond out there and use the funds. We're not trying to make these um, more cheaper. So if we partner with um, a program that has 10 million available, that means we're each gonna pay a little less and that means that money can get more chargers out. And if there's okay. questions on that, definitely um, any questions around that definitely please reach out to CSC to make sure that what you're trying to do is going to be allowed. Thank you. Sounds great. Thanks, Brian. If the workplaces site is planned to be a lease agreement, who should be the applicant, the site host or the lesser? How would the eligible cost for Cali VIP rebate be calculated? Investment am invested amount by the lesser or the lease payment? Andy, if, if you can uh, respond to that. So, um, first, uh, if anyone is essentially allowed to apply to um, Cali VIP in uh, the example of uh, the question that's being asked, um, you need to consider um, who's going to be making the uh, payments, who's going to be incurring the costs. Whoever is listed as the rebate uh, recipient organization or applicant organization. Uh, on the online application and in the site verification form needs to be the organization that is incurring the cost and will be the organization that receives the rebate check. Thanks, Sandy. For level two chargers, does the chargers need to be open to the public or can it a school qualify for charging their school buses inside the contained bus yard? So for level two charging, um, they can be private, but again, um, these are dedicated for light duty um, primary purpose chargers. So as school districts and schools are eligible, these need to be primarily used for light duty vehicles. These are not aimed to be school bus dedicated chargers. Um, that said, if again, if these are primarily being used in the area for um, light duty fleets for the school, um, for the teachers or for um, students, et cetera, and that's used during the day, and then at night, the school buses can also benefit from that that would be allowed because then again the primary primarily used purpose is for light duty and so any charger that is going to be um, primarily for medium duty heavy duty chargers will not be allowed thanks brian hmm, let's see Another question we've received, do churches or religious schools qualify for Cali VIP incentives? Um, this is Andy with CSC. You can probably answer that question two ways. Um, churches or religious groups are an organization type and they are an eligible applicant type. The second part of answering that um, would be uh, what installation site um, they're applying for. Uh, if they're applying for um, a, uh, a church church hall, um, a facility like that, um, as that site type is not an eligible DC fast charger site, it would be only eligible for level two um, electric vehicle charging. However, if a uh, church organization has an eligible applicant, um, had a site that was um, uh, a, a restaurant, for for instance, um, stand alone uh, public uh, publicly available restaurant um, that that could be a, a eligible DC fast charger site. So.
Thanks, Andy. The next question is around clarification on incentive amounts. For the $5,000 per level two port general market rebate, would a dual port station that can charge two vehicles at the same time be eligible for a $10,000 total rebate per station? $5,000 per port. Yeah, this is Andy with CSU. That's correct. Um, it's a $5,000 per connector um, for the level two electric vehicle chargers. And to clarify a little further, again, that one charger with the tool, uh, two ports, connectors coming off of it, each connector um, is aimed to try and supply that 6.2. So the EVSE itself really would need to be a 12.4 um, KW capable charger to split that um, evenly between the two connectors. Again, all of those charges will already be listed on our eligibility um, PDF and drop down as well. Great, thank you. Another question we've received, if a company hires me as a project manager for this project, how would we track the cost of my time to submit as a planning cost? Yeah, this is Andy with CSE. If you're providing services um, of some sort, whether it's project management or other, um, and you were to uh, invoice the uh, rebate recipient for your your time per uh, whatever contractual arrangement uh, you make with them, um, that uh, invoice and paid costs from uh, from your client would be uh, an eligible cost under uh, the Sonoma Coast and Center Project. Yeah, and to add a little bit, when, when we're talking about eligible, you know, design and planning costs, that's really saying that someone is working on analyzing the site, designing a site plan, having that ready pretty much, anything that's required to really submit to a permit um, submitting company or a jurisdiction that whatever is required to get that done. So it's not really, you know, planning coordination um, of looking where you're gonna buy um, equipment and materials and stuff. It's really getting the actual work of planning the installation, designing it, and going through the permit process. But all of that re would really be documented in, as Andy stated, an invoice to um, the applicant. Thank you. The next question is, when speaking about a minimum of two years warranty on a level two station, does this mean that the initial installation must have a two year warranty or needs to be available for a two year warranty? So to clarify, this is Brian with the commission. To, to clarify, we, we don't require a two year warranty um, on or a five year warranty. What we require on the equipment is um, a two-year networking agreement with a network provider um, and a five for level two and a five-year networking agreement with a network provider for DC fast chargers. Um, equipment itself does usually come with some standard um, warranty and extended warranties are an eligible cost as well in Cali VIP. For example, if I have a level two charger and it comes with a one year and I want a five year, whatever that cost is, is also now eligible to be submitted for um, the cost calculation to the rebate for Cali VIP. But again, what is required is the two year and five year networking agreements for level two and fast chargers. Thank you, Brian. Is the NFC payment method required or is it one of the most, just one of the multiple payment methods? Yeah, so um, they are one of the eligible. So again, we just state that we don't mandate or require any specific type of payment requirement at this time. We are stating that you must have 
two methods of your choice. So it's up to you to decide how that is um, until obviously you must comply with other laws. Um, Cali VIP continues to um, grow our technical requirements um, and we will, we've done a couple of workshops around that, but we will um, likely be adding some future requirements in the coming years as well. Thank you, Brian. Another question we've received. As a network provider, we have a monthly base network fee, which is reflecting the cost of the network transaction and the necessary maintenance. Can this network fee be counted as one of the eligible costs? Yes, so since we do require the two-year and five-year networking agreement, um, that cost is eligible towards the rebate. And so, for example, if you have a monthly cost of $20, $30, and it's a five-year requirement, then you would take your monthly cost times the 60 months, and that needs to be prepaid um, at the time when you're submitting um, all your backup documentations. When before your rebate can be paid, each applicant must prove that they have either that two year or five year networking agreement executed. Thank you, Brian. We don't have too many new questions coming through, but I can read off just some of the last couple questions. Um, this next question is about launch timing for the project. As of right now, what month do you see the application date launching? TBD. For... Go ahead, Andy. Yeah, for um, this is Andy CSD for the Sonoma Coastal Center project, um, we're looking at a summer time frame, likely July or August for the launch. Um, again, if you've not signed up for um, uh, information by uh, email from CaliVIP, we encourage you to go to CaliVIP.org uh, and sign up to receive future email communications on that exact month and, um, and timing for launch. Yeah, and what I would add again is this is a, a choice from the Energy Commission as well that, um, you know, we want to really be aware and um, handle what's happening in our state, the country, and the world. Um, and as we're proceeding right now, why is it July or August? Um, we want to plan that, you know, hopefully everything gets better and restrictions are lifted and people are back um, in some form of normal <laughs> as best as possible um, this summer. But obviously, if things drastically change and doesn't go to exceed the plan, then you know we will adjust our schedules accordingly. But you know we are hoping that people are back to work in June and July and that we can have a release in July if possible. Thank you, Andy and Brian. Another question is, can you talk about how the program is being marketed? Yeah, this is uh, Andy with CSD. Um, and I can uh, go through, uh, generally, as, as first as you noted, we will be providing a, a pre-launch webinar um, but we've been working with both the uh, Energy Commission and with the regional partners, Sonoma Clean Power and Sonoma, uh, Northern Sonoma uh, County Air Pollution Control District on a marketing and communications plan that uh, reaches out to um, the, uh, the property owners, businesses um, across all of Sonoma and Mencino County with um, with some focus on um, areas where uh, chargers have not been um, placed to date as well. Um, we'll utilize uh, multiple methods uh, for that, um, uh, in including um, uh, mail, uh, uh, email, um, 
customer uh, outreach by um, uh, some of our, our partners is uh, being con- being considered as well. Um, and uh, we will have uh, several uh, dedicated audience landing pages for the different types of um, site types or, or users that could consider um, uh, EV charging uh, and the Sonoma Coast and Center Project incentive. Uh, Nelson, I, we haven't heard much from you yet, but is there anything you'd like to add from the Sonoma Clean Power perspective to that? Not exactly. We've just been working with you guys to uh, finalize the communications plan, and we'll be also uh, leveraging some of our communication channels um, to do more outreach and marketing. Great, thank you. We've just received one final question that we'll go over. Are you aware of a resource that aggregates funding sources and staffing potential for chargers? So, um, this is Brian. I can say that there, there's multiple resources. Um, one that we try to do, Cali VIP itself, um, we, when you click on find a project on the homepage, you'll see our eligible um, projects that are open right now, but as well, um, we have some um, other rebate programs as well in our serv- in the area where our projects have launched. Um, that page right now really needs to be up to date as it um, only includes really the Fresno County and Southern California counties and is not truly reflective. Um, other programs or areas where this um, is beneficial, I know a lot of the EBSC manufacturers um, have links for their rebate or for rebates from other programs um, statewide and nationwide as well. And there's also um, one being developed, I'm not sure if it's online or not, but Grid Alternatives um, is working with ARB to develop um, a one-stop shop on um, all EVSC funding and stackability as well. So at this time, I I don't can't say there's one best one to go to, but there are multiple resources to try and get as much information as possible. Thanks, Brian. We'll conclude the question and answer session with that question. Um, thank you to our panelists for being available um, during this session. Um, then we can move forward with the next um, slide. So this slide um, is to provide some additional information and resources available um, outside of calivip.org itself. This is the Energy Commission's Cali VIP docket and the link to it. So this is directly on the Energy Commission's web page. Um, if you type in on the search that 17-EVI-01, um, you should be able to find it. And what this allows uh, is just another additional resource where you can submit comments to the official public comments to the Energy Commission on any Cali VIP item um, that you want to comment about. Um, it also allows you to look and review any past presentations that have been given. Um, we try to create an event for each presentation. Um, we'll then post the slide deck um, in the following days or week, as well as the recordings um, to that um, area. It also allows you to sign up for the Energy Commission's Cali VIP email listserv. So we definitely encourage everyone to do both the Energy Commission and Cali VIP's uh, listservs so that you get as much information as possible for upcoming events. And this is just the general contact as well for um, Cali VIP through CSE. 
um, the phone number for contacting them, as well as an email with specific questions just to um, the Sonoma Coast Project. On the landing on Cali VIP as well, there is additional contact us information outside of this. And again, please sign up for as many listservs as possible so that you're always up to date with all of the information. Um, there's also a resource on Sonoma Clean Power, um, their website under sonomacleanpower.org slash programs slash Cali VIP. So there are multiple resources here for the same project. And um, with that, definitely uh, myself, I want to thank everyone for participating. We had a huge audience. I think it was over 180 participants. And so I want to thank everybody for um, all your time and participation and interest as well. And I'll leave it to Andy and Divya to give any other closing remarks. Thanks, Brian. That was all great information. Um, I did want to mention that this presentation slide deck will also be emailed to the attendees this afternoon. We've also, we're also going to be recording this um, entire presentation. And as we work to finalize that presentation, that will be up on the Kelly VIP YouTube page within the next couple of weeks. Um, but we would love, we would like to thank all of you for joining today. Um, we hope you have a great rest of your day and stay safe during these times.